are not very clever. As, <laughs> yeah, as we go through, they're not real <laughs> poetic. Um, but this is the burial chamber, and around this central burial, we found many other burials, many of them stopping right on top of one another. Remember, it was illegal to violate a tomb. You could not violate a tomb. And we're going to see that later on, Constantine, when he decided to cover up this necropolis, obviously he's ignoring the law that says you cannot violate a tomb. To the point where tomb robbing became kind of a natural pastime. So his uh, sons who, who uh, succeeded him after his death had to reimpose that law so strongly that it became a capital offense that you could be, you could be killed for gra rob robbing a grave just because it was so common because the emperor was doing it. If the emperor's doing it, then anybody can do it. Okay? Um, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for that. Now remember, right around here though, we have burials in the first and second century that are coming right around that they're all underground there, right near that tomb. They violate each other, they're stacked on top of each other, but none of them encroaches on that area, which we call niche one. They all want to be close to it, but none of them encroach on it. We're going to see why. Let's go into the necropolis itself next. We go back to our uh, map, which you have in your hands, okay? And we're going to see the actual excavations. We're going to start walking our way through the mausoleum from the east to the west. All right? Bless you. Um, we're going to start here in these two mausolea, which really are the only two mausolea that are open to the public in the um, southern row of mausolea. And then we're going to go to the northern row of mausolea here. Next, please. The first tomb that we enter is the tomb of the Egyptians, so-called because of the Egyptian gods that are inside. Go ahead and click one more. And we have the Egyptian god Horus here in a fresco. Now, this looks kind of faded. Remember, this was done around the year 200 or before, 1600 years ago, 1700, 1800 years ago, somewhere around there. It was incredibly long time, or 1800 years ago that this was painted. How was it preserved? We're going to see that in a few seconds here. It is a mixture of uh, Egyptian gods and Roman gods. Uh, it's not unusual to see that in these mausoleums because we did have a very metropolis town of Rome, a city of Rome, where people from Egypt were there, people from Greece, you know. And also it was not uncommon for people in the same family to practice different religions or for one person just to kind of hedge his bets and offer to all the gods, okay? Just to kind of make sure we're just covering all the, all the bases here. Okay. We see that this is the falcon-headed god, Horus. Okay, sorry. Uh, next slide. We also see here, um, we see a magnificent sarcophagus dating to the third century. On it is a very familiar funerary scene, and that is the scene of Dionysus. Dionysus, also known as Bacchus. Okay, the god of wine. Okay, why was the god of wine on burial? sarcophagi and other burial things. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to see, anytime you see Bacchus or Dionysus represented in a funerary setting, you're going to see several things. First, go ahead, click. We see Bacchus, then we see, go ahead. We see a staff. He's always leaning on some sort of staff. Okay? That's a Bacchus after all. Okay? <laughs> and then we see a tipped cup. Right? Always a tipped cup. It's always just about to spill. Uh, so to show that he is an all right, so that the afterlife is considered kind of this wonderful state of eternal inebriation. But just like with regular inebriation, there's a dark side, and we see always a leopard or panther to show that little bit of the dark side of the inebriation. So we see Dionysus uh, in a couple of places, actually it's throughout many of the mausolea, but there's two prominent ones that we'll see in a few minutes here. So we always see this. Now, in this burial chamber of the Egyptian, the tomb of the Egyptians, we also find a Christian burial, and we know it's a Christian burial because they use the, they use the letters DP for depositum. <laughs> Pagans use the word puzzlement. I placed the body here. That's permanent. Christians use the word depositum. I deposit the body here. 
It's only temporary. It's only temporary. Next, we move to the next tomb, which is the tomb of the Marcy family. Okay. Again, we see some magnificent uh, frescoes. Unfortunately, the slides aren't going to be able to do justice to the frescoes, although they have faded over the years that they've been exposed to uh, the air. Uh, Mar this is Quintus Marcius Heracles and his wife Marcia Thrasonis. Next, we're going to see the sarcophagus in which uh, the Marci are buried. We see Quintus here, and um, we see his wife here. He praises his wife as a woman of great uh, joy and beauty. You see here these striations, these uh, stridulated lines, these wavy lines. They represent two things. One of them is the waves of the ocean, the eternal in and out of the ocean. Again, for the pagans and for Christians early on, this was a sign of eternal life. Then, you, um, you, the, other, the other thing it represented is uh, particularly warriors, but other people, would use oils to clean themselves. And they would put the oil on their body, and then they would use a stick that had any kind of striated lines on it, and they would channel the oil off. So that oil, again, was a sign of strengthening, a sign of anointing, and for, for pagans as well as for Christians, but mostly for pagans at this time we're talking, uh, it was a sign, again, of eternal life. Kind of an interesting thing in this, uh, we're going to see her come back again in a minute here, on one of the walls we see, next, okay, again, well, I'm sorry, on, on here we see, excuse me, we see Bacchus, okay, and again, we see his tipped cup here, we see the staff here, and we see the leopard or panther here, okay, you're kind of getting hurt, uh, anyway, there we go, okay. On the next slide, go ahead, sorry, uh, we see the judgment of Paris. Now, excuse me, this is kind of, I'm hearing feedback, all right. uh, we see in the tomb of Quintus Marcius um, the judgment of Paris. Now, what does the judgment of Paris have to do with anything? Okay. The judgment of Paris was one day there was a great feast in heaven, and the goddess of discord in, in Olympus, excuse me, heaven for that, Olympus, the goddess of discord, for obvious reasons, was not invited. Not to take that slap lightly, she took a golden apple and she inscribed, to the fairest on that apple, and she threw it into the party. And immediately, three of the goddesses began arguing over who should get it. Okay? So, um, that left everybody in uproar and tumult and, and discord. All right? So they turned to this poor sack who happened to be standing there by the name of Paris. And they said, Paris, you decide. Okay? And he decided that it would go to Aphrodite. Okay? And that started the whole Trojan War. But I won't go through the whole thing. That just. Yeah. But the idea is that apple is to the fairest. All right. Next, we see here uh, Quintius's wife Marcia holding the apple to the fairest. That's what he thought of her. That's why he put the judgment of, of Paris up there because they would know that she's the one who is the fairest. Isn't that nice? <laughs> we know, by the way, that this sarcophagus was built for them while they were alive because the faces are so uh, exact as to what they look like. They aren't stylized at all. They were done while they were alive. Yeah. So you can have, go ahead and click that once it's finished. Two thirds. Okay. Let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, click once. We see the tomb of the Egyptians. Click, click twice. Tomb of the Marcy, and then we're going next. We're going there. Okay, we're going right over here. Back to the second century. The first one we see is the tomb of Propelius Heracle. One of the important things about watching this is this is the last one to the east. The last one to the east. We know there are more tombs that way, two more mausoleum that way. Again, they can't go that far. This is what all of the mausoleum looked like for 1,600 years, or roughly eight times the age of our country, all right? From the year 320 or so, until today, that, I mean, until uh, 1939 to 52, that's what they all look like. Filled with dirt, filled with rubble, filled with the stones of the, of the roofs. You can, we, we, they found um, uh, remains, shards of, of pottery that was used by the construction workers on the new basilica. Water jars and things like that would get broken, they would just throw it in there. Right? 
So this is what all of them look like. So when we're looking at these mosaics and we're looking at these frescoes, we can go, oh, they're kind of beat up. Remember, they were covered like this for 1,600 years, right? Up here we see the codicide of Gaius Propelius Heracli. Okay, next please. Uh, on this stone, it is the codicile of his will. And, or this stone, on the, on the front of a tomb, the stone is called the titulus, and it means the title. It's the title, so it tells you who's buried inside and something about them sometimes. It's like a headstone. Ex codicile means from the will. It says he wants to be buried, click, in batik, click, achir. Okay. That means on the Vatican Hill, at the service. Okay? So again, we know on the Vatican Hill, at the Circus of Gaius and Nero. This was important information because it verifies that the circus was nearby. This again was important because they needed that verification because they hadn't found everything they have since found about that, um, uh, about the actual circus. He also says in there that he wants to be buried near his friend, Umpius Narcissus, okay? And we believe his body then is buried to the east because the one to the east was built before his and then the next one over here was built after his. So we think maybe they were, you know, like drinking buddies would go to the circus together on Sunday, you know, toss down a few, you know, uh, meads or whatever they had back then. And, um, you know, so they were buddies, they wanted to be buried next to each other. We go to the next tomb and we see the tomb of Fani Redempta. Again, these are magnificent frescoes that have been preserved for centuries. Uh, it is built of an inner court with a vaulted roof and an outer court that was open to the sky. Remember, we are built into the side of the hill. Many of these burials, the mausolea, are built partially into the side of the hill. On the top of the hill were the Vatican gardens. The Vatican was very famous for its wine. They said if you wanted to poison your wife, give her Vatican wine. It's supposed to be the worst thing ever. And that's because the soil composition was very erratic. It went from a very clay uh, composure to a, 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 mar a marly, a sandy marl, and uh, very different kinds of composition of the soil. That didn't make for great wine growing, as we here know, because we grow wine. We, we grow wine, we grow grapes, and then make wine. In fact, I think we have some bottles here. Okay. So we're going to see a mixture of inhumation burial and cremation burials. The cremation burials were original. The inhumation burials were probably added later. Again, on the side, you're going to see some, one of the magnificent frescoes. This is a fresco, obviously, of a peacock. Why was the peacock there? The peacock would lose its feathers in the, in the winter and regain them in the spring, a sign of death and new life, even to the pagans. The meat of the peacock would, lasted longer than any other kind. I can't, for right now, I can't remember who it was, Aristotle or something, something like that, did a test. He took several different kinds of meat and he put them there, and which one lasted the longest before it spoiled? And the peacock meat meat lasted the longest before it spoiled, which was always a kind of, what do you call it, uh, uh, some sort of a tradition, kind of a saying, kind of a uh, folklore type thing, folklore type thing that the peacock lasted longer because it embodied some element of immortality in it. That's why its meat lasted longer. So they would use the peacock in funerary um, decorations to show immortality. 